welcome to the Conversations with Authors podcast with me, Alison Thompson, aka The Proof Fairy. This podcast is an excuse for me to have a chat with a published author about what inspires them to write, how they go about the writing and publishing process, and what effect publishing a book has had on their life. And I also find out what tips they have for other aspiring authors. My guest on the show today is David M. Summerfleck. David is a digital marketing specialist with over 20 years of experience working for marketing agencies. He's also a podcaster and the author of a workbook called The Road to Digital Marketing Profits. Hello, David. It is really lovely to meet you today. Thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Lovely to meet you too, Alison. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. So tell me a bit about your book. Well, uh, my book is called The Road to Digital Marketing Profits. It's a workbook. And um, basically the premise of the book came about because I had been working with so many clients in the realm of digital marketing. And I found that I kept getting the same questions over and over again. What are all these different technical terms? What are these different technical approaches? People were... uh, who were business owners were taking the different approaches and putting them in the wrong sequence. They were misunderstanding some of the terminology and some approaches. They're working with people who were not professional and then wondering why they're not getting any results and on and on and on. So I thought, well, let me put together a workbook that will take the small business owner who's at this beginner level of working with digital marketing and try to guide them uh, from beginner to the point where you should understand digital marketing fairly well at an intermediate level. And by the end of the, the book, you should have clarified what your content should be, what your SEO should be, who your ideal consumer would be, and have a business plan also that you could take with you to a bank or credit union to get a loan to show specifically that you understand digital marketing now, and you know how you're going to use it to build a legitimate profit-focused business. And so that's the basis of the book. And after I wrote that, I realized that there was so much more I wanted to add. So I started working on a visual version of that uh, called the Illustrated Guide to Digital Marketing, which for now I haven't found a publisher for because there's so many infographics and charts and cartoon images and whatnot to try to demystify technical concepts, but I go even more in depth with it. So that's the premise of the book. Okay, so yeah, so it sounds like you were inspired to, to write it through your, your desire to, to share your knowledge and to, to help other business owners. Absolutely. I, I worked for marketing and ad agencies for, you know, at least 25 years. I actually went back and looked through, you know, my, my CV the other day, and I felt very ancient. I looked through it and just you know, realize why I didn't realize I'd worked at that many places. And there were probably some that I'd forgotten. So 20, at least 25 years working for different marketing and ad agencies. And of course, in between those positions, I would work as a freelancer, you know, working for different clients and uh, doing what's called white label work for other marketing agencies where you do work for them, but they basically put their name and logo on your work. So was this your first experience of actually writing something that you published? I mean, I guess working in marketing, you, you do a lot of writing anyway. But. Well, actually, I mean, I went to college uh, with the, you know, with the, my major was, uh, and I was an English major uh, with an emphasis in creative writing. So I earned a BA in English with an emphasis in creative writing. And I studied Shakespeare, Chaucer, Keats, Shelley, um, those were my favorites, medieval journalism, poetry, nonfiction, uh, some graduate level courses in Latin American literature and so on, uh, the, you know, filmmaking and so on. And I had worked several internships while in college for marketing agencies and publications as well. 
So about halfway through college, and having worked those internships, I discovered that there really were not that many actual decent paying positions for writers or editors mm -hmm. in the area where I lived. So that made me realize I really needed to familiarize myself with the internet, building websites on a serious level and familiarize myself with the internet marketing, which at that time in the mid nineties was still relatively new. And the irony, of course, is that it was very new to, to so many business owners back in the 90s. And now we are here, we, you know, 2021. And the irony is that those who need it the most still statistically do not use it. That's interesting, isn't it? That there, there's so much. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Is it a, a complete overwhelm of, of platforms? I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think, I think that's part of it. I think it's a multitude of factors, actually. I think... Uh, I was also not coincidentally um, a small business mentor for several nonprofit organizations off and on for about 10 years. And I learned through that experience that the majority of small business owners and nonprofit organizations, they, 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 I mean, obviously they're new, so they don't really know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So the overwhelming majority of the time, they'll go to what are called free, free, you know, quote unquote, uh, do it yourself template builders, and then wonder why six months later, or in some cases, six years later, why nobody's calling them, or they're not getting more emails, or nobody's buying what, what it is that they have to, to sell or their services, whatever. And it's because basically you're being given this free do-it-yourself template, but unless you're already an expert, you're not going to know what your SEO should be, what, what content you should be writing, how you should be linking, how you should be marketing and branding yourself and in what order you need to take all of these things. So hence the book. And, and so I think that's a lot of it. And I think a lot of it, is a result of what I call the savior complex, where so many people try to do everything by themselves, even people who have larger businesses or their enterprise businesses where they have, um, you know, they've been around for five years or more, they have several employees, but they're still micromanaging, they're still doing everything themselves by themselves. And that's just a recipe for dysfunction. You're going to be tripping over your own feet because just it's too much. If you own a business, you should be managing the business. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be meeting with, um, you know, networking locally, meeting with chambers of commerce and meeting with other business owners and other associations and representing that business not trying to write content, not trying to figure out what your logo should be and how to slickly produce video commercials. That should be left to professionals. Mm -hmm. But your book will will give businesses the, the tools to, to understand that process themselves, I guess. To... Right. And I mean, the, the challenge is that there's always so much more that you could add. So where mm -hmm. do you stop? So... The, the road to digital marketing profits is meant to be a broad overview in workbook form. So by the end of it, you should understand key concepts, know who your ideal consumer is, know what you should be writing and producing to try to nurture and attract them and have a business plan put together specifically tailored for digital marketing. You know, like I said, that you could take to a, a lender so it should give you a good firm, you know, uh, uh, kick in the pants to get you going in the right direction. Yeah. And then the illustrated one is even more in depth. So I probably need to stop adding to them, really. <laughs> you can't you give know, There's just so much that you can <laughs> cover, you know. How yeah. much do they really need to know? Well, the impetus is in being committed and being motivated and breaking free from this, this, this savior complex to try to do everything yourself. At what point mm -hmm. do you actually look for someone professional to help you? Yeah. You know, and that's differentiating it from a hobby that you do for fun to an actual profit focused business. That's very serious to you mm -hmm. that, you know, a, fa a family is looking to you, 
you know, this is a, a, a profit focused business that we need in order to pay the mortgage or take care of other people's livelihoods. Those are the ones that really need to break free from the savior complex. Mm, mm. You say, look, I, I've got to have one person in charge of scheduling, one person in charge of digital marketing, another person, you know, in a very organized, deliberate manner. Yeah, I think that the authors are also um, um, have a tendency to to fall into the saviour complex as well. I think a lot of authors think, well, I've written the book, I can edit it myself, I can proofread it myself, I can, I can format it myself. And and I mean, proofreading, you cannot proofread your own stuff. I think that's, yeah, that goes without saying. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Mm. It, it doesn't work, actually, even for uh, blog posts. Because the way I was always trained working for marketing agencies, we had very tight deadlines. So you would be, we worked, uh, basically we had 30 day deadlines for everything. And in some cases we had weekly deadlines, you know, and then you would have someone checking in. So the way I was always told was first get something created because that's the hardest thing. You can't Just edit start nothing. Writing. Yeah. <laughs> Just start writing, then go back and edit it, add more to it, look for grammatical errors and so on. So you would write something in three to five iterations or versions, you know, first the content, then the links, then go through it, check for errors. And then after that, you would look at, well, do I want to add any infographics? Do I want a featured image? Look at my SEO if it's going online and you kind of take it in that order and then look at maybe see how I'm going to tie it into other blog posts that I've written previously, which are called evergreen content that you make mention of repeatedly in your blog posts and who do you link to and so on. Um, but I've gone back and looked at blog posts I've written a year or two ago and, and seen grammatical errors that just, you know, made me you know i was surprised to see them mm, mm. well when you, you know there's a big difference between the word mm. can and can't you know if i tell someone you can do something but i want it to be the word cannot or can't you need to make that correction because a big difference in terms of meaning big difference yeah and when yeah. when when you've written something and you've edited it and you've edited it again and you've changed it and you've added something else and then you've read it again you 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 know what you've written or you think you know what you've written don't you so then it's very easy to to miss those kind of things because your brain just reads can and it reads whatever you think it should say not what's actually on the paper yes i i think a good uh um, metaphor for this would be you know when you drive to work every day you go there every day, you come home the same way every day, you take the, the train to work the same way up, the same way back every day. Unless you're really, really engaged, you're not going to notice a subtle change. You know, if a business is no longer there, or if a business changed its sign or something, you're not going to notice. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same way with what we write and create you've gone over it so many times, you're not going to notice any changes. And certainly when it comes to digital marketing and your website, there are changes in technology, there are changes in plugins and changes in SEO. You're not going to notice if there's something different with that. And again, and again that's, you know, the more you want your appearance online to be professional and above board and better than competitors, the more seriously you want to take it, you know, the more directly it's tied in mm -hmm. to how you earn a living, then yeah. the more seriously you want to take it. You know, I interviewed someone yesterday for my own podcast and I told him, I said, of, of so many people I interviewed just for this podcast alone, I said, it's really, really surprising to me just how sleek and professional you present yourself online it just gives people this impression that you're very professional mm -hmm. you're very serious and committed to what you do so you have every right to charge more because you do more and i've noticed that you know looking for doctors in an age of covid in florida there's so many doctors who don't address covid at all who don't require that you wear a mask 
they don't take it seriously. They see it as a joke. I've called doctors and I was told by the office, I've been to doctors. Actually, I went to one doctor who said that he thought it was a conspiracy against Donald Trump. The office staff thought it was a joke. Then I called other doctors who said that they don't do anything to address it. If you want to wear a mask, you can. If you don't, that's fine. Anything, one, one doctor told me anything could happen. You could, you know. Um, and it didn't instill a, a great deal of confidence in me. So I would, you know, so I would look at the website and you would see that there's no mention of it at all as if mm. nothing had changed in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. So consumers are more sophisticated today than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So when you have a website that doesn't work on a modern phone, that doesn't look like your larger competitors, you know, that can't be found in Google. You know, if you can't pay for services online or download download forms or submit forms electronically, what's the excuse for that? Mm, mm, yeah. No. There really is. It's not like we don't have the capability. So yeah. it communicates to the savvy, discerning consumer that your interest isn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why why not just to go to a competitor? Yeah. You know, I've looked at vendors who I wanted to purchase items from, but you couldn't purchase from them using PayPal or Amazon payment, which are very reputable, very known around the world. So I would just think, well, why not just go to Amazon? Forget yeah. it. It's just not Fair worth enough. it. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so back to your book. Um, how did you go about actually writing it? I wrote it um, as a Word document, just putting all my thoughts together and just saying, you know, what do I really feel that I get asked about the most? Okay. And then what would be most relevant to the average small business owner or medium business owner who would contact me, what do I get asked the most? And so I wanted to put that down. And then the other questions were, what do we write about? How do we know what content to create? How can we identify who our ideal consumers are? Um, you know, at a very basic beginner level in terms of marketing. So mm -hmm. I wanted to put something together that would really address these issues and then give them some, not marching orders, but basically a business plan that they could take with them to a credit union or a bank or, or where, wherever mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and show that they knew what they were doing now, that there was some type of deliberate considered structure to how yeah. they were going to use the money but also to what they did mm -hmm. yeah so i wanted to put that together in a word document and then i just thought like the marketer the marketing agencies i'd worked for get it out there first then you can go back and edit it and that's okay. one of the things I, I like about amazon is i can go in there and i can add more and then just resubmit it as a word document and mm. hopefully it would let me do that. So I just made everything eight and a half by 11 because it was so much easier. The formatting for the cover, uh, design for the text, everything was just so much easier if I made it all eight, eight and a half by 11. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to deal with the different formatting issues that would be there. If you wanted to add an image or a quote or something like that to, to chop up the text visually, to give it some variety, it would have caused all types of chaos. So it's predominantly text with just a few uh, image quotes to give it a little bit of visual mm -hmm. uh, variety. Yeah. So you published so through- So that's published, why I chose that. Yeah, I was gonna say, so you published through Amazon's KDP print? Yes, I did. And I took my time doing it. And there was an option to distribute it to libraries and other vendors and other suppliers around the planet. Um, so you had to charge more, you had to let them charge more in order for the book to be distributed to Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Walmart, um, and libraries around the globe. 
So I thought, well, that would be preferable uh, to me. And actually, I didn't want the book to be downloaded as a Kindle uh, ebook. Okay. I wanted people to have solely the organic feel of a paper book that you could take out and write in with a pen or pencil. Mm -hmm. Because I just felt like with it being a workbook, if you have it as an ebook on your Kindle or, or, or reader, or what have you, you're really not going to be taking out a pen and scribbling on, on that, are you? You know, unless you have some type of stylus. So even though I'm a webhead and I love digital marketing, when it comes to writing and reading, I'm still very tactile and I still mm -hmm. prefer the actual paper book myself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted this as a workbook to be available in paper format first and yeah. foremost. It's really interesting you said that. I, I am a, a, a huge Kindle fan. I very rarely buy paper books nowadays. I read everything on my and Kindle. And my wife is the same way. Uh, unless, unless it's some kind of workbook. And I have learned through experience, yeah. yeah, if it's a workbook and it says, right, stop and do this exercise, on a Kindle, I won't. I think, oh, I'll come back to it later. Yeah. <laughs> but if I have a print book, then I'll pick up my Exactly. Pen. And you're not going to, yeah. yeah, you're less likely to do yeah. it. Um, now, I haven't gone back and done the audiobook version, um, which I think would be a fun option. Mm. But for, for me, it's always been produce the content first, then right. go back, then go back and add more. Um, you know, perhaps add more infographics or what have you. So now mm -hmm. I'm at the point where I'm trying to publish the illustrated version, which is, I would say it's 60 or 70% similar, but it still has a lot uh, other factors that are different from it mm -hmm. because it's just so many pie charts and infographics <laughs> and you would literally read it like you would a graphic novel or a comic book but you would still take a pen or, or pencil to fill in the workbook portion. Mm, mm, mm. So whether or not that'll ever be published, I don't know. So I offer it through my website at dms.blue so people can just download it as a PDF straight okay. away from there. Mm. One, of the, one of the many um, advantages I think of, of publishing through Amazon is the ability to be able to go back in and upload new files. So if you spot a mistake, if you want to change something, if you want to add something, you can do that whenever, can't you? And rather than a traditional publisher where you can't do that, or if you've kind of vanity published and you've got 88,000 copies of your book in the garage, you're stuck with them, aren't you? But Amazon, you can keep refreshing it whenever you want to, keep changing it. Right, right. And also with the more vanity publishers, it's more difficult um, in terms of not just reaching a wider audience, but also ordering copies for yourself. So for Amazon, I thought, well, how many copies of it do I really need for myself? I'm not going to physical networking events and physical workshops, which previously I would do. Mm -hmm. um, so now how many copies do I really need? You know, uh, three copies in English would be wonderful for me. I may order some copies in Spanish just to have for fun. You know, if I do get to visit Portugal where you are or, <laughs> or Spain or what have you, I could have a few copies in Spanish just for fun and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe yeah. take to local bookstores or what have you if COVID is better than which by the time I'm able to go, I'm sure it will be. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah I'm, I'm sure you know, yeah. a year or two from now, it will subside yeah. and be like an annual flu. Yeah, but that's the other thing as well, isn't it? Amazon gives you the, the ability to go in and order one copy at author price if you want, or a thousand copies. So you, you do have that flexibility to, to do that. Yeah, which is really good. So yeah. have you learned anything about yourself through writing the book? Oh, absolutely. Um, I learned that, you know, having gone to college and studied writing very specifically, uh, that I had, a, you know, by the time I graduated from college, I never really realized how much of a love-hate relationship uh, I had developed. Because you go in, you know, from my own perspective, I had gone into college with a very passionate love of literature. Uh, and then by the time I had graduated, I really hated it because I couldn't really read. 
uh, without diagramming. You know, I couldn't really read without looking at the, the sentence structure, the mm. pentameter, the symbolism of, of the plot, you know, the plot structure, the, the protagonist, the narrative voice, and so on. I, could, I really couldn't read without analyzing it anymore. So I had to tell that voice inside my head to shut up. And, you know, comparing uh, what you write to your own preferences. You know, for me, I always was a huge fan of Ray Bradbury, uh, who I perceive as being a great American literary stylist. Mm -hmm. you know, very beautiful prose. And then people who were kind of humorous, uh, like uh, Kurt Vonnegut. So I have my own favorites um, in literature. I mean, Graham Greene and um, Thoreau and, you know, business books, nonfiction books, liter uh, fiction books. And so by the time I had graduated, I really wasn't the same person. They had flensed any sort of love of literature from me. Mm -hmm. So how do I get that back? You know, so I started watching the great courses online and trying to get back my love of literature. And I started working on a dystopian novel that I've always wanted to write a novel. So now I'm going back and forth between some ideas for a couple of other business books and then a dystopian uh, book. So I'm kind of working on the outlines for all of those and trying to decide which one really excites me the most to mm. focus on. So you you have got your love of your love of reading back. I love reading, but it's the writing that is like uh, like dental work. You know, it's, it's it's like doing your taxes. So for that, I have to really get back that reckless abandon. You know, I think I was a better writer when I was a high school student than I am now, because back then I had no care. I wrote mm -hmm. like I felt. I had no um, filter. I wrote uh, with reckless abandon. You know, I was reading voluminously. I was reading at least one book a week, if not more. And, and so now I read much more slowly, very methodically. And uh, I need to get back to that, just remove that part of my brain, you know, so I write more as someone not concerned, just put it out there. And if people like it, great. If they don't like it, you know, what have you lost a few dollars for, yeah. for, you know, a book at the end of the day, but uh, obviously you want to do the best that you can. And Ultimately, the only way to really do the best you can is to not be so focused with appeasing everyone or mm, the inner you, critic. You can never please everyone, can you? And you'll probably never please yourself. <laughs> no. it'll, it'll be never perfect. There's no such thing as perfect when it, when it comes to writing. No, and it's a fallacy to, to try to do that, whether it's in life or in business, or in, in your own creativity, which is, if you really think about it, in our creative uh, peregrinations and what we do creatively, uh, appeasing others is the last thing that you should be doing, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because it's supposed to be the most representative of yourself, your true voice. And so if you can't sing your own song, then, then why bother opening your mouth? You can't be authentic. So, yeah, for me, the challenge in writing is to still the inner critic and just say the inner critic, listen, you're a good person. Look, look, re revisit this a year from now, inner critic. And then as far as actual writing, obviously, you want to do the best you can, but you just have to say, I'm going to trust that my vision is, is me. And that hopefully there'll be other people who will find it and want to uh, read it and enjoy it and get something from it. You know, I, I'll just say really briefly, I remember seeing an interview once that really impressed me with uh, the filmmaker, Steven Spielberg. And they asked him, how do you decide what movies you're going to make and what do you make them about? Oh, wow, they're so crazy and everything. And he said, well, actually he said, you know, when I was a kid, I went to the movies and I watched Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and the Lone Ranger and all these movies that had cliffhangers. 
So what I make is hardly original. And I made movies that I knew I would want to see. Mm -hmm. So the idea being, surely there must be other people in the world like me who would enjoy the same type of movies. And if people don't like action movies with these cliffhangers, well, it's not for them. They won't want to go see it. The reviews will bear it out. So it worked out for him. And I thought, you know what, that's a really brilliant approach that I need to take. Just write for people who I think would like the same type of thing, who would have mm -hmm. the same disposition. Uh, so in terms of, you know, going forward, that's probably what I would do. You know, that's what it's, I try to do is write for uh, other people, you know. Yeah, uh, we're, we, we, we're all unique, but actually we're not all that unique. So <laughs> it's not like only only one person in the world is going to like what you write because, uh, yeah, if you like it, there are going to be thousands, millions of other people that will like it as well. But not everybody. And accepting that right. is, is just as important, but not everyone will like it. Yeah, when you buy a new book, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not investing what you would pay, you know, to, uh, you know, pay on a car note or something, you're not paying a rent or mortgage, you know, you're basically paying what it would cost you to go see a movie. And in many cases, a good deal less. So, you know, or, or the cost of a meal out, you know, so if it's something that you really enjoy, now you have something for the rest of your life that you can share with others that you can refer back to in the future and for years to come. If you don't enjoy it, then you're out the money that it costs you to go have a meal somewhere. And that's about as risky as that too, because I've gone out to eat in restaurants where I didn't enjoy the meal. <laughs> you know, I've seen movies that I didn't like. I remember I walked out of a few movies, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole point. Yeah. You have to do it for yourself first and foremost, and just have the audience kind of in the back of your mind as a guide, like a yeah. map. Yeah, no, those are really good tips. Have you got any other advice for, for anyone? Um, maybe in a similar position to you, maybe who someone who is a consultant, business consultant, whatever kind of consultancy they might be running, who is thinking about writing a book related to their industry. I would say to this whole idea of jumping in is just complete bunk. It's just complete gibberish. The idea, uh, people saying jump in and uh, all of these things, it's really counterproductive. There's no job in the world that's going to hire you with no previous experience in that industry, unless you're dating the, the person interviewing you. You know, it's just completely ridiculous. You would never dream of getting in the car and going on a cross country road trip with no gas in the car. So it's, it's just ridiculous. Um, I think that you should write what you know about the most. And I remember Hemingway said something akin to that, that you should write what you have experience about. You know, all of Stephen King's best work were about writers or teachers because he was a teacher. So he wrote I've about what he that. knew. <laughs> I've never noticed that. All his, all his yeah. characters are writers or teachers. Never knew that. <laughs> Absolutely. All of his characters were writers and teachers and Ray Bradbury, whom, you know, I love his, his style of writing. Most of his protagonists were authors, mm. authors or good natured husbands, really. <laughs> and it's quite true. So he wrote from his level of comfort. So that's my recommendation is to write from your own uh, idiosyncratic perspective you know mm -hmm. what you know about more than others because it's going to give you a level of comfort and familiarity when you reach out whether it's a dystopian novel set in you know a horrid dark future or a utopian novel set in a future paradise or you know whatever it is that you write about or a business book write it from the voice of your own uh personal journey it will mm -hmm. resonate more legitimately with the reader and give you a greater comfort level. And that way you can focus on what really matters most. You know, when you water everything down to its most essential qualities, that's what you want to write about. You know, why am I really here? What is the impact I want to make on the reader? And that's, that's what I look for. Uh, that's really good advice. Yeah, write for yourself and write what you know. Yeah, focus on quality, 
first and authenticity and the marketing will really take care of itself because if it's really good, people are going to read it. Mm -hmm. People are going to want to read. Yeah, yeah, no, that's very true. So, David, you've you've mentioned that you're you're dipping in and out of a few writing projects at the moment. Um, so, what's what's next for you? What what do you think will be the next book you you publish? Oh, I don't know. I can't decide, Alice. It's <laughs> brutal. Um, you know, um, I have uh, a few ideas for books. Um, I have about three business books that I think I'd like to write. There's one on SEO. Um, where I basically take a marketing person and we walk through, you know, how this person would come up with an ultimate uh, SEO strategy to try to really attract the most consumers to this passion project of theirs. So that's one. Okay. Then another one is a marketing book based on my experience. In um, when I took Aikido in college, I loved it very much. And I wanted to apply some of the principles I had learned from Aikido to marketing and, and business in general. And maybe something about this for the struggling freelancer who just can't figure out how to get a grip on, you know, how do they structure their freelancing business so that they can attract the type of client they can help the most, but they also want to work with the most. Mm -hmm. So those are some ideas for business books. And then, like I said, I've been tinkering around on an outline for a dystopian novel um, that I want to also kind of be reflective of how I feel uh, and where I see us headed in the future, possibly. Okay. Now that sounds intriguing. That sounds... And that would be very, very different, obviously. That would be very different. Mm, mm, yeah, no, it will be from the business books, won't it? We're, we're nearly out of time here, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But before before you go, I want to ask, you have, a, obviously this is a podcast so nobody can see it, but you have a very beautiful shade of blue shirt on, a blue mug, blue glasses, blue headphones. There's a little blue picture on the wall and a blue pen. There's a blue book on the shelf. There's lots of little accents of the same shade of blue. What's that all about? You know, I, I used to do, in be, well, while I was working at marketing agencies and in between working at marketing agencies, I would always teach a lot of workshops in, of course, digital marketing and SEO and using WordPress and so on and so forth. So I would do a tremendous amount of workshops and I never really knew how to dress or how to coordinate anything. And I, my favorite color was blue, but I never really knew how to dress very well. I was never just a, you know, a great gadfly or anything when it came to dressing. So one day I asked my wife, I said, what should I wear? And she said, she said, she said just wear your favorite color all the time. <laughs> and she said, you know, you're a marketing guy. People will remember you. And then um, about three years ago, when I got rid of the LLC and just became a solo, you know, person, I'm semi-retired now. Mm -hmm. I still enjoy working with clients, but I don't need to if I don't want to. So I'm very selective. But so when I did that, I just said, just simplify everything. So I'm DMS.blue. Those are my initials. It's what I do, digital marketing solutions. And it's my favorite color. So I just, you know, started wearing blue whenever I would do a workshop or a boot camp or what have you. And it would make it so much easier to dress, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I worked with an optician. Part of our, 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 our deal working with the optician was I'll create this beautiful, you know, custom website for you. I'll make you number one in Google. I'll teach you how to automate all of these processes and get more government contracts and so on and so on. I want this amount in money. And then I want this amount in glasses. <laughs> because, Love it. you know, in, in the US, we don't have a national healthcare mm. service. So glasses can be several hundred dollars easily. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you want special frames or tints or, or what have you. So I just said, I, I want at least five pairs of glasses in blue, five pairs of glasses in purple for my lovely wife. And then I want the rest in, you know, upfront payment. So that was part of our plan. So I have mm -hmm. all these blue reading glasses and so on. So that's a long winded yeah. answer to a short question. <laughs> and when you held the book up earlier as well, I noticed that the, 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 the book, the book cover is, is, has a lot of blue on it as well. So I guess that that's just, yeah, I just yeah. 
part of, but it's also part of the branding. It makes it very easy. So when people see something I produce, they expect to see blue. It gives it a feeling of calmness, but also he takes this, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, seriously in terms of being professional, how he appears to others. So I want to communicate that to readers, but also others. So to, to give them an idea. Yeah. of what should should be what is branding what is mm. you know, what what's this all about yeah no it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to illustrate to illustrate branding that you you are the brand you the brand goes beyond the business you are the brand exactly yeah i really am <laughs> Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you today. Thank you so much for being a, a guest on the podcast. Before you go, where can people find you online? Absolutely. Just go to www.dms.blue. You can type dms.blue into Google. You could type dms.blue into YouTube and see some videos I've made. I'm all over the internet. And um, I have my own podcast, the David Summerfleck podcast. So if you'd like to apply to be a guest, or if you have a business or digital marketing question that you would like to submit, you can actually go to dms.blue slash podcast guest and uh, submit that information there as well. And thank you for asking. No, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for for today. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. I enjoyed uh, talking with you. Have a great day. David for being my guest on the show today. His book, The Road to Digital Marketing Profits, is available on Amazon, and you can also find out more about David on his website, www.dms.blue, or listen to his podcast, The David Summerfleck Podcast. If you've always enjoyed writing and have been inspired to take that a step further and write your first book, I can help. Have a look at my website, www.theprooffairy.com, download the free workbook, and book an exploratory call with me. You'll also find all the episodes of this podcast there. And if you're already a published author, you'll find information on how you could be a guest on the show. If you've enjoyed this podcast, then please subscribe, share it, rate it, tell your friends about it, review it, tell the world to come and listen. This has been a Proof Fairy production, and I'll be back next week with another inspiring interview with another amazing author. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.